First of all, I want to thank everybody for being here. As I look at all the presenters, I feel rather humbled and honored um, to be asked to come and talk today. So thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Um, so I've never been diagnosed with a progressive neurological disease. So when I stop and think about getting that diagnosis, I can only imagine the thoughts that would go through my head. And one of the things I think I would be concerned about as I look to the future is, what am I not going to be able to do anymore? What, what am I going to have to give up? And um, I didn't pick up my clicker. And that's why I really wanted to start with this quote is, don't let what you can do, can't do, interfere with what you can do. Don't let what you can't do interfere with what you can do. And today I am here to talk to you about something you can do to help you fight your Parkinson's disease, to help you manage your symptoms, to help you maintain your mobility for as long as possible and to move more easily. And that's with exercise. <clears throat> so why should you exercise? Regardless of whether you had Parkinson's disease or not, you want to exercise so that you can improve your cardiovascular system, help your heart and lungs work a little bit more efficiently. And the side note here is that cardiovascular events are the second leading cause of death for people with Parkinson's disease. Also, exercise can help improve your muscle strength and endurance. If you have stronger muscles and you have more endurance, you're going to be able to complete your da uh, daily activity, activities of daily living uh, more easily. It makes it easier to move around. Exercise can also help improve your flexibility. It can help improve posture. And it can help reduce falls. And falls are the number one leading cause of death for people with Parkinson's disease. Not necessarily the falls itself, but sometimes the complications that come along post-fall. And finally, and this is really important, Exercise makes you feel better, both emotionally and physically. So when I start talking next about why exercise, because you have Parkinson's disease, one of the things I want you to keep in mind is this bottom sentence right here. Exercise makes you feel better emotionally and physically. Because along with Parkinson's disease, one of the symptoms that frequently shows up is depression and anxiety and changes in mood. And exercise can help that. And then physically, not only can you get stronger and strengthen your musculoskeletal system, but you also can sleep better because you're moving. And you can um, uh, help your constipation should this uh, happen. So exercise has both. Uh, benefits for both non-motor and the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So specifically for PD, I already said Parkinson's disease can help you improve your cardiovascular system, but it also can help improve your neurological system as well as your musculoskeletal system. One of the things about Parkinson's disease is that we know it's a progressive neurological disease. And along with having a progressive disease that we're familiar with, we also can predict that there's going to be some pretty predictable impairments or constraints that come along with the disease. And exercise can help a lot of those constraints. Medication is great, and it's really important to take your medication, but having opti optimal medication, combining it with exercise can help. Medication cannot help freezing and balance, and exercise can. Also, exercise helps boost the neurotransmitters of your brain, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more detail in just a moment. And finally, 
exercise is indicating, um, research is indicating that exercise can help delay or slow the progression of the disease. <clears throat> so I just mentioned that exercise can help boost the power of the neurotransmitters. So how does that happen? Um, there's something called neuroplasticity. Anybody familiar with that term? So really, neuroplasticity is the brain's ability to change itself in a real uh, layman's term. But uh, Parkinson's disease affects a lot of the circuits in our brains. And oftentimes, there's not a complete circuit. Well, exercise can help find a new pathway if there's a pathway that's damaged that can't get those neurons to it. In order for exercise to be neuroplastic for you, your exercise does need to have these four components. Number one, it needs to be task specific. I just mentioned that Parkinson's disease affects a lot of the circuits of the brain, and a lot of those circuits are circuits that affect learning and memory. And so when you think about doing an activity that's task specific, you want to make sure that you really are working on developing motor skills. And, and um, when I say motor skills, it's things that you would do every day, like stepping and swinging your arms and thinking big. And so you really want to make sure that your exercise is very specific and very goal-based for learning to help those circuits. And then uh, ex your exercise needs to be s difficult. In other words, your exercise has to be more than just going through the motions. You want to be able to work at an effort that is a little bit more than you would choose to do on your own. You need to push yourself a little bit. It needs to be hard. And it also needs to be complex so you can have some good cognitive engagement, 100% focus, and uh, finally, it needs to be intense. And uh, I talked about learning just a second ago, and one, how do you learn? Repetition, 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 right? But it can also, uh, repetition can also help with intensity. There's also something called neuroprotection. So exercise really may help um, protect the healthy neurons and slow um, the neurons that are degenerating. It's important to note that <clears throat> the benefits of exercise can be reversed with inactivity and stress. So what that means is, I don't know if anybody of you have said, I'm going to start exercise, and you get going, and you go full bore, and then you stop. Then you lose all that benefit. So really what that means is that your exercise needs to be something that you continue every day, all the time. It, it, it needs to be continuous. And stress can be pro-degenerative for you as well. But guess what? What do you think helps with stress? Exercise. So you want to keep your stress level low, and uh, exercise can help with that. And um, then also, the benefits may be increased with socialization. That's a, a good, uh, that's a good plug for getting involved in some kind of group exercise class, um, because group e I found with the classes that I teach, it almost becomes a support group all in of itself. So being with people can help increase the benefits of neuroprotection and neuroplasticity. Finally, some current research is coming out that is really suggesting that there's a strong correlation between cognition and mobility. In actuality, they're interrelated. So that by improving your cognition, you can also improve your function and mobility. And on the reverse side of the coin, improving your mobility can help improve your cognition. Let me have a show of hands. How many of you are exercising already? Oh, awesome. That's great. So this is just all a review for you, right? 
So I could be done now, or? That, that's real, that's so, for, for those of you that are, just consider this as a little review. So just, just say you just wanna get started. How do you get started? Number one, you wanna make sure that you get your physicians okay. Make sure there's no other health issues that you have that would interfere with exercising or that could harm you if you were to exercise. And then you wanna make sure, and I think this is probably one of the most important things Choose activities that you enjoy. Because you just heard me say, if you were going to exercise and you want to get the benefits of it for your PD, you need to keep doing it, right? So if you choose to do an activity that is just a bore to you, the likelihood of you continuing on with your exercise is not very great. So make sure that you find something that you really enjoy doing. And if you are getting uh, started, make sure you're, you start slowly. I want to I wanna give you a little bit of a foreshadow because in a few minutes, I'm going to talk about everything I really think you should be doing. And I don't want you to be overwhelmed by that. So I want you to keep thinking. I said start slowly. So you need to start with a little base and then gradually build up. I'm gonna to talk to you about what I think would be a good scenario, but you probably, if you're just getting started, don't wanna start out with all that. And so people have said to me, and I, you know, should I go to a class? And I just talked a moment ago how socialization can help increase the benefits of exercise. And so, well, should I just go to a regular spin class, or what's the big deal about going to a Parkinson's exercise class? Well, I say if you want to go to a class, you should go to whatever you think you're going to enjoy. But there is some benefits in finding a class that is Parkinson's specific. Actually, I believe there's a lot of benefits. Um, one of them is that you're pretty sure that you're going to get someone teaching the class that is familiar with Parkinson's disease and knows how to address the many symptoms that you need to address when you exercise and um, can help keep you safe. Then, um, then you also want to stop and think about um, feeling like you're just part of a group. Because I've heard people go to a club and they say they went to a Zumba class and they felt very self-conscious. So if you go to a group where other people are experiencing the same things you are, you just feel, and I'm, I'm not telling anybody you're not normal, but you feel normal, right? You feel like you're, there's nobody looking at your tremor or nobody's noticing that you might not be picking up your feet. So it just gives you a little sense of comfort. So say you don't want to exercise with a group. You're not really that group kind of guy. Well, sometimes motivation can be an issue for people. And it's good to find a buddy then, somebody to help hold you accountable so you're more likely to stick with a program. Find a neighbor to walk with, or a spouse, or a care partner, or somebody you enjoy being with so that you can have fun while you're exercising. How many of you go to physical therapy? Okay, so I always recommend that a really good place to start at the time of diagnosis and continuing on throughout your journey is with a physical therapist. Because if you find a physical therapist who is well-versed in movement disorders, first of all, you're gonna get a baseline, and they're gonna look at your strengths and weaknesses, and they'll get you started on the things that you need to work on. And if you're working with a Parkinson's exercise specialist, your physical therapist, and, your, and when she releases you to the community, they can work together. Well, this person needs to work on their posture or they need to work a little bit more on picking up their feet. So there's a, a, the beginning of a team for team support that you could rely on. And then you have physical therapy benefits that you can use every year, right? So why not use them? Why, why not go back year after year and get the expert advice um, to help you? It's a great place to get you started. And then finally, listen to your body when you're exercising. You know you're going to have days where you just don't move as good. You just feel a little off. So you listen to your body, and you might not push as hard. The old adage, no pain, no gain, not true. Not true at all. Pain is a signal, 
And if something feels not right, then you need to listen to it. I do want to make a side note there, though, because I'm guessing some of you have pain all the time. So when I say pain is a signal, I would say it would be pain that you're not used to having, pain that's a little bit abnormal for you. So what, I was talking to somebody before we started today, and she says, okay, so, so what should I be doing? What, what type of exercise is really the best for me? And really what I think is so exciting in the field of exercise and Parkinson's now is there's just a real lot of programs to choose from that are evidence-based or at least theoretically based that have been shown to be successful. So if you're looking for something that you like to do, you have choices. So nobody has said this is exactly what you have to do, but these are some programs that have shown some really good success. One of them is Tai Chi Moving for Better Balance. I don't know if any of you heard about the Parkinson's study um, that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2009, Dr. Fusan Lee, and he compared Tai Chi and strength training and stretching. So he had three different groups of exercises and they tested before, midpoint, and after. And the Tai Chi um, group really um, showed the most benefit in terms of improving balance and preventing falls. I'm going to brag a moment because I feel a little proud that I was able to teach for that um, research project. Um, and Tai Chi is great. Uh, I, um, I, I, I didn't tell you when I started, but I live in Portland, Oregon, and I teach a lot of group exercise classes for people with P Parkinson's disease, and I have a really great university, Oregon Health Sciences University, that has really a lot of good researchers in their Parkinson's Center, and they've developed what they call the Agility Boot Camp, which is kind of a multimodal program, and it includes, it includes working on gait, and it includes um, stepping or lunging and walking an obstacle course and the power moves that Dr. Becky Farley has developed and then boxing and then Tai Chi. So kind of a whole blend of different exercises uh, incorporated together. Uh, think big and then out of think big, Dr. Farley developed the power moves and they're all just really high amplitude, full body activation and really the power moves are just four moves and you can do them standing, seated, on the floor, on your all fours, on your back, on your stomach. And um, then finally, high intensity heart rate or strength training. You just heard me say a, a little bit ago that intensity does matter. And sometimes finding a program that's gonna push you, like the pedaling for Parkinson's that you saw out in the atrium, uh, the idea of forced use exercise. And if you don't like regular exercise and you like to dance, well then dance, because there's been research projects that have been done on the tango and the dance for Parkinson's disease out of um, New York. It's become a national program. Does Denver have one, a dance for PD? Um, and then um, finally out of Indianapolis, rock steady boxing. So lots and lots of great options for you now with Parkinson's disease and exercise. I mentioned uh, at the start that one, one thing about Parkinson's disease is that there are pretty predictable constraints or impairments that happen, and exercise can help address those. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to go through some of the real common constraints or impairments and talk either about exercises or types of exercises you can do, or else strategies that you can use to help work through those symptoms. So the first one is rigidity. We all, uh, with Parkinson's, you get tight. And a lot of it's in your trunk, your hips, your neck. So things that can help rigidity are trunk rotation, axial rotation around your spine. So turning your neck, reaching, twisting, um, anything that requires rotation is going to help. Reciprocal motions. Reciprocal motion, both sides of your body are doing the same movement. So when you're walking, you're walking in reciprocal motion, thinking big. And I'll tell you what, if you're using that big arm swing, you're also getting tr trunk, ro ro trunk rotation. And then rhythmic movements can help with rigidity. 
upright alignment. So what's the common posture that people with Parkinson's tend to fall into? It begins kind of with a little chin, shoulders, then the narrow stance, right? So we're here. Well, when this happens, all these muscles on the front side of your body, they're being contracted all the time. And they get stiff, and they get tight. And so um, you want to make sure that you're standing tall to keep those muscles stretched and open. And then thinking large amplitude. So all these things can really help you address rigidity. Like my typos, I have a few typos in here I noticed last night, so apologies. Bradykinesia, slowness of movement. <clears throat> so what can we do for bradykinesia? And you're gonna see some of these common theme. Thinking big because bradykinesia is a smaller, slower movements. So not only think big, but think fast. Think big arm swings, fast big steps, and then high effort, that intensity that I was talking about, full body ac activation. So tell me, what's the difference between this and this? This and this, what's the difference? I'm activating everything. And so when you move and when you're exercising, you want to make sure that you're putting all your body into it. Freezing is a real common problem. And um, think alignment first. So I'm going to get back into this posturing that in order to prevent a freeze, first thing you want to do, say you're, you can't go. You're stuck, right? First thing you should do is stop. Don't try to work through a freeze and get into that little festinating step. Power up. Get yourself nice and tall. Widen your feet so you have a bigger base of support. You're going to be more stable. And then practice weight shifting. Because really, in essence, walking is weight shifting. And a lot of times, Freezing happens because it's hard to pick up a foot because they haven't transferred all your weight to the other side before you pick it up. So even just getting yourself into a little rock or a little march before you get going and then, uh, and then take off. And are any of it, you in here freezers? Not very a few, huh? Well, freezing typically is very common in small spaces. So how do you get better at anything? Repetition and practice, right? So practice moving in small spaces. But practice moving in small spaces where you feel safe. It might be navigating around in your bathroom or at your kitchen, around your kitchen, around your counter, where you have something to hold on to. And then also practice dual tasking walking and talking, doing two things at one time. All those things can help freezing. Um, and I miss the external cues, and this is very important. Um, you can use external cues. If you get stuck, one thing you could do is lift your head up, get yourself aligned, and just say, I want to get from here to that door. Am I looking at you good enough? Okay. <laughs> And just guesstimate, how many steps is it going to take me to get to that door? For some reason, that kind of creates a little pathway for you. And then just look at that door and start counting. And I see it work nine and a half times out of 10. It just gives you that focus to go. And does it matter whether it takes you 60 steps and you thought it was going to take you 40? No, but it's just getting you, giving you that momentum to get going. Poor sequential coordination. What does that, what does that mean anyway? Um, you know, as we grow up and we begin to move and we start moving around, a lot of the things that we do every day become very automatic to us. We don't really stop and think about getting up from a chair and, and rolling over in bed. But with Parkinson's disease, we lose that automaticity. It's not so easy. And um, 
making the transitions from one postural position to the other becomes a little bit difficult. So practice postural transitions. What would be a postural transition? Getting up out of a chair. I'm going to use that as an example. And then plan it in advance. Kind of think to yourself, kind of rehearse. OK, what do I need to do to get up out of my chair? What's the first thing you need to do? Anyone know to get up out of your chair? Get, get your butt forward. Get your butt forward, right? And then, OK, get my butt forward. Then I need to get my center of gravity or my center of mass forward. And then I might need to push into my thighs or the handles. But just kind of rehearse it in your head and figure out all the steps you need to do to get there. So anyone in here ever fall? I'm, and I'm gonna, I'm, I, I think I'm going to feel really safe in saying this. I think a lot of times with Parkinson's falls happen because we're in a hurry to make that move and our minds aren't quite making that transition yet. So sometimes just slowing yourself down, planning that move out, and sequencing it, how you're going to do it, can help you with sequential coordination. The other thing that happens with Parkinson's is we tend to rely on our vision more than any of the other five senses. So um, the, um, we have something that we use. Uh, anyone ever heard of the word proprioception? It's really your body's ability to be able to determine where it is and how all of its parts are moving in space, or kinesthetic awareness as, as well. And so you lose that with Parkinson's. And um, some strategies, now these are all strategies to help you pull in all those other senses, is try really trying to use some of the other senses besides vision. So one activity that you might do is stand where you feel safe at a high counter and play with base of support, because the narrow is less stable, wider is more stable, and just close your eyes. And, and take the vision out of it. Try to keep yourself from swaying. Or practice doing activities. We do an obstacle course in the OHSU program that I teach at. Um, and we put on basketball dribble glasses. Anyone ever seen basketball dribble glasses? Well, they're little glasses that you put on, and it takes away the bottom field of vision. So it challenges your vision. And um, you know it has a tendency, so like we'll put them on when we practice big stepping. And it's kind of amazing where you get people stepping big, and then you put these glasses on, and their steps aren't as big anymore. So practice using and not relying on your vision so much can be very helpful. Um, also decreasing surface dependence. Uh, try to use different surfaces, grass, sand, carpet, hardwood floor. Um, in an exercise program, I would, might bring out a foam pad or a little cobblestone river rock. So you're, you're practice walking on different surfaces. And um, have uh, changing your orientation, not always standing at the same spot and looking at the same thing. Varying your orientation can help with that as well. And then also, we need to think about slowed thinking. Processing kind of takes a little bit longer. So one thing, and I've talked about this already, that you can do to help with um, processing is really uh, do exercises really 100% bought in, that you are totally engaged and very intentional and focused on your moving, um, and do things that require a high level of engagement. And practice dual tasking. And we're going to practice a little bit of some cognition here in just a moment. I talked a little bit um, about how the correlation between cognition and mobility, and mobility and cognition. So this is one of my other typos. This should say incorporate cognitive challenges into exercise to enhance the cognitive and mobility benefits. So what does that mean? So 
let's just say you're on the treadmill and you're walking, you might all of a sudden think, okay, what's the words to my favorite song? And as you continue to walk, try to come up with the words. Or count by threes, or do some kind of math equation, or think about words that rhyme or things that are yellow. So those are types of things you can add in to your movement. And um, then there's some very, um, three, uh, really fun cognitive challenges. You need somebody else to do them with um, that incorporate cognitive tasks, not like spelling or saying the alphabet, but really um, moving that requires a high level of engagement. And I would like to try something with you all now, if you don't mind. We're tight on space, but um, what I'd like to do is I, um, I do some boxing with cognitive challenges. And so if you want to, I'd like for you to box with me. And um, just imagine that you have on the boxing mitts and I'm either holding targets for you or there's a big bag there for you to punch. But I, if you feel like you have space that you want to stand up, you can stand up or you can stay seated right there. And we're, I'm just going to demonstrate some little fun little cognitive tasks we can do with boxing. So if you're standing, the first thing you need to know is that you need a stable position, right? So how do our feet need to be if we're stable? Wide, wide base of support, right? Knees bent. And we got a lot of meat back here, don't we? And that's going to prevent us from moving forward onto our toes. We need to kind of push those hips back a little bit. So this is a nice, stable stance. And then you're going to engage all the muscles from your hips to your shoulders. So you're very stable. Belly button in at your spine, chest up. And when you're boxing, Guard is always up. You always need to protect your pr pretty face. And if you're sitting, you can do this too. You can try this with me. So palms would be facing each other here, one hand in front of your face all the time. So I'm going to teach you two punches, and some of you might know them. One of them is a jab, and that is a straight out and in. Straight out, out in. Try the other side, out in, out in. Out in, okay, you got the jab. And the other one is the cross, and that's rotation, right? But remember, one hand's guard up. So right, left, right, left. Okay, so you have those punches, right? Okay, guard up, we're not done. So now, so don't be scared, don't be scared, we're gonna do it. So now this first thing, it says response inhibition. It's called Go, no go. So I am going to cue a jab or a cross. You need to listen for my cue, but you're not going to punch until you hear me say go. OK? And I might say no. <laughs> and if I say no, you don't go. OK? So are you ready? Right jab. Up. Oh. Right jab, go. Right jab, go. Right jab, go. Left cross, go. Left jab, no. Oop. <laughs> Left jab, no. Left jab, go. Left jab, go. Left jab, go. Right cross, no. Oop. I saw a few of you. Uh, <laughs> you know what? I love it when I get you, too. OK. so. <laughs> So, you know, in our daily life, stay right there because we're going to do more, but in our daily life, we do a couple things and we do need to all of a sudden stop. Say you're walking along down the street and you're talking with a friend and all of a sudden the light turns red, right? And you have to, you have to inhibit a response. So that's what response inhibition is. Go, no, go. And so now this is really just challenging your brain. So I'm just going to have you throw opposites. I'm going to have you throw a punch, and it's just going to be a jab. So we're just going to use that out in, out in. But here's the rub. When I say right, you hit left. OK? Can you do it? Let's try it. OK. Right. Right. Left. Left. 
left, right, right, left, right, right, left, left. Okay, so you know you get, you 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 have to yeah you, you have to think right. Okay, so the the last the last thing I want to show you, and um, I, actually I. I want you to imagine that I am your target, okay? So I'm holding up these two, imagine I'm hold, I am holding up these two targets for you, and I'm gonna give you a cue with my hand, like this. So when I go, can everybody see me? I'm really tall. <laughs> Would I stand up? Okay, okay, I promise I won't fall, I promise. Okay, so when I go like this, you throw a right jab, right? And then when, so you're like this, so when you see me go like this, you go boom, right? So I'm the only one like this, okay? I'll empty my pockets now. Um, okay, so, so I'm gonna go like this, and what are we gonna hit with? Okay. Okay, okay, now I'm adding to it. Now, I'm going to turn my head this way, and you would throw a jab. And then when I turn it this way, you'll throw a jab, right? And I'm also going to do this. So now you need to pay attention, right? You need to be 100% focused, right? So here we go. OK? Not, not done yet, not done yet. This is where the conflict resolution comes in. I'm gonna do those two things again, same instruction, except you're gonna ignore this. The only time, the only time you're gonna throw that punch is when you see me turn my head. Are you gonna, turn, are you gonna throw the punch when I go like this? No. Promise? <laughs> okay, okay, you ready? Up. <laughs> so w one thing that I one thing that I would do in a classroom. This is where I should have been talking the whole time. Then I wouldn't have been so nervous at the beginning. Um, w in a classroom, we would do what's called errorless learning. So say I have a group for this one class I teach with the boxing, I have six people. If one person makes a mistake, we keep doing the same thing until everybody gets it, because you need to learn, right? So, um, you can sit down now. That was, uh, you, by the way, by the way, you did, you did very well. You did very well. Okay. Um, just some fun ways, you know, to be engaged and to have to use your brain, get those neurons firing, right? So um, really think about creative ways to add some cognitive challenges into exercise. And um, so people, I have five minutes. I took too much time on that, but that was too much fun, wasn't it? <laughs> okay, so, so now I've told you all the reasons why you should. There's great programs out there, so what should you do? I think following the American College of Sports Medicine's guidelines is a really good thing. Remember earlier I said don't be overwhelmed by everything I'm gonna tell you to do? But these are things that you need. Three to five times per week of aerobic activity, walking, running, cycling, something that gets your blood flowing, large continual movement of those big muscle groups. If you had Parkinson's disease and you came to me and you said, I only have time to do one thing, what is it? I would say, make sure, I would say, no, can you do two things? Make, <laughs> make sure that you have aerobic activity. It, aerobic activity primes your brain. It gets the blood flowing, it gets the dopamine flowing. Very, very important. Um, and it's a must. And then I would say, then you really need to work on um, skill, aerobic training and skills. But if you can, because I have people that come to me and they say, managing their Parkinson's job now that they're, uh, 
managing their Parkinson's now that they're retired is their full-time job. So if you're retired, you have time to do all this, right? No, I'm teasing, <laughs> teasing, I'm teasing you. Um, so then strength training. Two to three times per week major muscle groups. But what I want to tell you about the major muscle groups, remember how we talked about this posture? And I talked about all these muscles on the front side getting tight and shortened. Do you think we want to go do chest presses, bicep curls, and crunches for all these muscles that are all these always contracted? No. You want to stretch the heck out of that front side, and you want to strengthen all the extensor muscles on the back side. So when you work your, when you work your muscles, you really focus on those backside muscles. The quadriceps are also extensors front of your leg. I'm not saying never work these muscles, because you need to have them. They need to be strong. But um, focus on the extensors more than the flexors. Stretching and flexibility. At least two to three days per week. That's going to help with tightness, rigidity, uh, make sure you're getting some rotation in there. This is new to the American College of Sports Medicine the last three, four years. They never used to have this. Now, remember I've said skill training, learning a skill. Each one of these, balance, agility, coordination, those are all skills that we need to have. Balance. I would bet, if I were to ask how many of you with Parkinson's have balance issues, almost all of you would raise your hands. And so um, balance can be active, it can be static. Agility, the body's ability to change direction efficiently. So remember how I talked about making transitions? You know, work on turning, work on um, footwork, and then coordination. That's why I always like to do these little cute dance moves so you can get coordinated. So in summary, to wrap up today, um, I'd like to tell you that if you have Parkinson's disease, exercise is not an option. It's an absolute necessity. And importantly, find things that you enjoy doing. Have fun. I mean, we, didn't we listen to that wonderful talk this morning about getting the most out of life? So you might as well enjoy it. And think high effort. Work harder than you would choose on your own a little bit outside your comfort zone. I like using a scale of one to 10 with people that come to my class. And ideally, I'd like you to be at about a seven or an eight, that you're putting out just about the most you can comfortably. And then pay attention. Be cognitively and physically engaged with what you're doing. Challenge yourself. Don't just exercise for the sake of exercise. Make it count. And then develop a team. Parkinson's is a disease that you just cannot walk through on your own. You need support. You need guidance. Um, and from, it can come from a lot of people. It could be your exercise trainer. It could be your family, your physical therapist, your neurologist, your speech pathologist. Build your team. And let your team work together to help you so that you have a great network to stay on track. And I'm hoping then today that I've given you some thoughts on how important exercise is and hope that you can walk out of here and continue on an exercise journey. You know, at, at um, the holidays, first of the year comes around, we all make resolutions, and then the resolutions get made, and then they fall off, right? So I, I'd like to suggest to you before you walk out of here today, if you're not exercising regularly already, make a promise to yourself. Think about what you would like to do and make a promise to yourself that you're going to start. Because resolutions we can break, but we don't break promises, right? So thank you for listening to me today. And. Uh... We also wanted uh, to, I'm sure you guys have some questions for Nancy, so, uh, and she's available to answer them. If you have a question, raise your hand and I'll bring the mic to you. This is just a comment for you, Nancy. It was interesting as you started out. Yep, oh, yeah, you're on. Can hear you. Okay, as you started out, you were very even and, <laughs> and so on, and as you got into your program a little bit, woo! Uh, <laughs> 
Thank, thank you. It was, it was my nerves at the start. My mouth got dry. I was shaking on the inside. <laughs> Hi. Um, regarding the freezing, um, my Parkinson's is only affecting my right side. So when I'm sitting down and I tend to get up, I always make sure my right leg is moving. Mm -hmm. I push myself to the edge and I go to move. My left feet will go, but then my right foot is still there. And that's where I tend to fall. So when you say your feet go, so when you stand up, when you go to yeah, stand go up, to it st is, it, is it after the stand? After the stand. And so my comment would be, so you don't have problems getting up out of, did you all hear the question? Everybody hear the question? So when she gets up because her right side is affected, she just can't get up and get out of the chair and, and move up. forward. I'm able to get up But out you of can't the chair. get yourself forward. And then I'll start with my left leg, but mm -hmm. my right leg. The right foot trail. So, you know, that could really be a lot of things. But one thing that I would say to that is, um, number one, before you go, make sure that you're powered up. You might want to decide where you're going next, where, where you're heading to. Get your eye on that target and say, can I count the steps? But a lot of it has to, be, has, has to do with the weight shifting all the way to your left leg so you can free up that right foot. So I would do some of those little things that I suggested is, you know, maybe work on a rock before you go forward. Get that weight shifting. Did that help or no? You're looking inquisitive. Well, I'm just like, okay, that's going to the bathroom. I ain't got time for all <laughs> <laughs> You have to practice. You have to practice those postural transitions. <laughs> Anyone else? Any? There's a question. A couple. Yeah. Hi, I just wanted to tell everyone that I had kind of an epiphany about exercise. Yeah, we all know it's good for us, but I read an, uh, an article that made me think of it differently, which is it's medicine for us. Just it is. like we wouldn't take our, miss taking our cinnamon, we shouldn't miss exercising. So it's a new way of thinking about it. It is a good way of thinking about it. Everybody hear that? That exercise is medicine, absolutely. It's not the quick little easy pill that you can take and swallow because you need to work hard at it, but exercise along with medication gives you optimal function. Any others? No? Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Thank Nancy. Thank you, everybody.